Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps. You called down the thunder, well now you got it. Right. You tell them I'm coming, and hell's coming with me, you hear? Hell's coming with me! Revolution Radio! The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listeners, radio, and now we return you to your host. And then Jake has a, uh, offered a few items uh, for us to discuss before uh, uh, we move on to talking about um, uh, edible uh, edibles that you might find um, in your back 40 or if you're out and about hiking or even if things uh, get worse than that, something that you can find to eat when there's nothing else around. So um, <clears throat> what I would like to do is I would like to uh, inter- introduce Jake now and uh, Jake, why don't you just tell us a little bit about your background, you know, where, where you came from and, and, you know, what your perspective is on on uh, what, you know, Diamond has going on here with the uh, um, with the Oppenheimer Ranch Project. <clears throat> Thank you, Scott. Um, my name's Jake. I was born and raised in western Washington. I currently live in Spokane, Washington. And Diamond is... A really cool GSM, GSM leader in the community. He has great information. I love the fact of the humility he puts in his videos. And all around, he's just a great guy. Uh, what, what was that other question, Scott? Oh, yeah, just kind of, you know, a little bit of your your background and, you know, kind of what brought you uh, to be interested in, in, in some of the you know the the weather, <clears throat> the the um, uh, Grand Solar Minimum related uh, information that he's putting out there. What you know? What brought you around to that? Well, originally, what got me into the weather, I was a really young kid, mind you. I was born and raised in Western Washington, so we don't get much snow over there. And on upcoming snow events, my brother would always nudge me, you know, have me peek out the window see if it starts snowing out. And mm-hmm. when that first flake, when that first flake fell, I got so excited, so mm-hmm. excited. And um, that's initially what got me interested in the weather. And uh, um, I'm sorry, you repeat that question one more time. Yeah, and, and so I'll, you know, I'll tell you real quick, kind of what brought me around, <clears throat> you know, to to discovering his channel was. You know, living here in Tucson, you know, we're kind of in a in a flight path, definitely a, a east to west flight path. Basically, Los Angeles, San Diego is just an hour, you know, hour and a half <clears throat> uh, west of us. Um, so, you know, what 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 I found was, um, you know, I, I'm older. Let's say I'm older than you are, <laughs> and I remember, you know, when I was younger. Um, you know, looking up at the sky, and you didn't think much looking up there and, and watching planes flying about. And, and you know, later as, as things go on, the, um, you know, the, the, the jets would be, you know, there's more and more flights that happen. And as I'm looking up, you know, I never, nothing ever really occurred to me. You know, there, the planes would fly over and there'd be, um, you know, there'd be a, a, a moderate um, contrail, condensation trail that would, um, that would uh, be left behind the plane, but you know, okay, there it is, and you kind of just know what that is. You know, you see it coming out the back, and and this is long before the day when you know every everything has. You know, there's a lot that is being set up against us, but you know, there's not everything is. So, uh, so as the years gone have gone on, and you know, you know, I had moved from uh, back east out out here to Tucson, and um, I've, I've been here since, uh, well, since 9-11, basically. I got out here in 2011, 
And <clears throat> when that was uh, sometime between then and basically now-ish, uh, I, you know, I would look up at the sky and, and all of a sudden I just, you know, I'm noticing that the, uh, you know, I'm noticing that the, uh, the planes that fly overhead, the, the, they're kind of leaving their, uh, <clears throat> their contrail behind them for, you know, it would stretch across the entire sky and, and pretty much the last year or two, not only do they <clears throat> stretch across the sky, they're, uh, um, they're uh, kind of staying up there and then they're spreading out. So, so, you know, my, you know, just being inquisitive, I just, you know, jump on the internet and everything you do, you jump on and, and uh, take a look around and, <clears throat> you know, everything that you run into was, uh, you know, people saying, oh, well, this isn't, you know, this isn't the condensation trail anymore. This is a chem trail. This is chemicals and these chemicals that are <clears throat> being um, sprayed out on us. So Essentially something yeah. that isn't normal is what you're trying right. to say. Exactly. This isn't this isn't normal. I know what normal is, you know, because normal I was used to and never noticed it again. You know, you, uh, but as soon as normal changes, then your body, your brain will say, "Hey, this is different. What does this mean to you?" And so, so I, you know, I do the looking up and <clears throat> you know the searches, and you know, sure enough, it just pretty much the consensus out there is you know, hey, someone's trying to poison us, you know, whoever that is. And um, and we had, a, we had a show a few weeks ago about this whole topic, but, you know, just, you know, I'm just kind of describing you how I got into it. <clears throat> and wh what I would do then is, you know, I, I kind of got deeper and deeper into it. And, and, and the more I thought about it, the more, the more it didn't, it just didn't kind of make sense to me because, you know, there's easier it ways to really deep down the rabbit hole. And the deeper you get into it, the more interesting it gets. Yeah. And, and I won't say, I won't say that there aren't some isolated cases where that type of thing is done, but no one can afford to spray the entire planet. Oh, I wasn't chemicals. talking about the chemtrails. I was talking on the GSM side of the changing weather, weather events worldwide. Exactly. So, so, you know, kind of not being comfortable with the fact that, you know, just being a reasonable person, you know, why, if, if these people are doing this, why would they be doing it to themselves was my question, because they're driving around and they're going to parties and they're on their boats and they're under the same cloud. So, so I, I kind of, you know, I kind of had something stuck in my brain that said, yeah, this isn't working for me. And so I kept looking deeper and deeper. And that's when I I did stumble upon um, uh, some of these channels, uh, such as Diamonds. And uh, so, yeah, I started listening to Diamonds channel, uh, Adapt 2030, uh, Ice Age Farmer, and a couple others, Suspicious Observer. And, you know, I'm listening to all these people, and they're, and they're talking something that is acceptable to me, that is reasonable and um, kind of meets my personal requirements of, you know, what you know, what would be the purpose? You know, that's the thing for, with any crime, you know, what's, you know, what's the reason? You know, sure, the government has opportunity to do anything at any time, but what would be the purpose in it if they're spraying themselves? So that's kind of been my, um, that, that's kind of how I got into it. And, and so I was just, I thought I'd throw that out there anyway, but I just wondering from your perspective, you know, how did you, you know, what were the steps that kind of brought you about in, um, you know, to where you would, uh, um, that, you know, that, that's, a really, that's a really good question. So I'll, I'll tell you about that. So it was about two summers ago. It was the summer, let's say 2016. It was, it was July. And like I said, I live in Spokane, Washington and I'm an avid walker. I walk on average minimum 10 miles to 20 miles a day. Oh goodness. And Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's quite a bit, so you got to have good feet to be able to do that. But uh, I was walking in on a north, you know, north-south facing street, and I was facing north, and this was like 2 in the afternoon, and there was a stiff northerly breeze, and okay. it chilled me. And in July in Spokane, it should be at that time of day, it should be about 80 degrees. 
And I thought to myself, I was like, something isn't right here. Definitely not right. So I did a little digging. That's when I found it at 2030. And then word of mouth from him, I heard of Oppenheimer. And word of mouth from Oppenheimer, I heard, I heard more people, more people, more people. And that's like I said, once you start going down the rabbit hole, it just keeps going. But it's a good rabbit hole. There's so much knowledge to know and so much information that we all need to learn from one another. So that's initially how I got into the GSM. Excellent. <clears throat> um, what now? Um, you know, we were talking a little bit before, and and it, it sounds like you've you know you've done a little bit of your digging in this arena. Um, uh, so um, I I know that that you've had some you've done some work with. Uh, um with fish and so would that be would i be wrong in saying aquaponics or are you strictly just it's more fish raising not fish and plants it's fish raising to use their waste to fertilize a garden okay so it's kind of more huh so it's kind of like halfway there It's, it's just it's not completely integrated where one yeah. feeds the other directly, but it's 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 the same basic concept, right? Yeah, exactly. I, I'm just I'm my approach. I'm more of a rationalist when it comes to my decision making and the things I get into. Like aquaponics is really good for you know the leafy greens and uh, the the things that give you a lot of micronutrients. But I'm in it for something that is substantial that can hold a person from day to day and that's the humble potato because the right. potato is the only uh, vegetable that can give a person enough calorie intake for one day I think it's like maybe like four or five large potatoes you meet your carbohydrate need for the day mm-hmm. so that's why I am going with aquariums using their waste Man, you got to manually take it out and water your plants. But, however, there is more concentrated beneficial bacteria in the fish filters. So rather than, because when you have aquariums, you need to do something called uh, gravel uh, vacuuming. It's where you put okay. a vacuum pump in the gravel and it sucks up the, 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 the poop, the, uh-huh. excess organic, the excess organic material in the gravel. That's good. Don't get me wrong, plants will love that, but the in, so on every fish tank, you've got filters. Uh-huh. So it could be an internal filter, external filter, or a cartridge filter. And in these okay. filters, there is so much nitrogen-rich, organic uh, plant food at your hands. And what I do is you got to use the aquarium water to squeeze the sponge in it, because if you're to squeeze it into tap water, the tap water actually kills a lot of the beneficial bacteria. So you use some of the aquarium water to clean the fish filters in it, then you just dump that on your plants. For instance, uh, uh, currently I'm actively growing potatoes, onions, and radishes. I've done the math. At the end of my potato harvest, I'll have about 1,000 pounds of potatoes, and I did a beta test. One plant, no, with uh, no... Uh, beneficial organic fish waste added to them. The height of that plant is was four inches, and I watered another plant with concentrated beneficial bacteria from one filter, and that plant is 10 inches, and that was a growth of six days. So mm-hmm. that plant grew six inches in six days, so that's about an inch a day. Uh huh. That's how potent and powerful and just so... The plants just love it. They crave it, to say the least. That is excellent. Um, so, so if you're with a thousand pounds. I mean, what kind of fish are we talking about? How many fish, you know, are, are we looking at? Well, it's uh, you don't need so to raise a thousand pounds of potatoes. You don't uh-huh. need like three. 125 gallon tanks. I got a 36 gallon and a 75 gallon aquarium. That is more than enough potential in those aquariums to feed my garden all year long. That'll actually say if I were to grow potatoes indoors in uh-huh. potato bags, it's more than enough because uh, 
the organic matter builds up in the filters, probably about once a month, you can get a good ringing out of the filters to be able uh-huh. to feed your plant. And it's just so nitrogen filled. But the one thing you've got to know, know about fertilizing a garden, it's best to use high nitrogen based fertilizers in the beginning of the growing season, like uh-huh. when you first plant. And then I would say like, I don't know, a month, two months, maybe max, you want to really cut down on that because if you fertilize too much with nitrogen, your plants will just flower. They will not produce vegetables. Oh. And we saw that the flower was a good thing. You know, when you saw the flower, you knew the vegetable wasn't far behind, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, you but not think, okay, I, uh-huh. I see flowers, so uh-huh. I'm doing something right, so I'm going to keep doing it. But come harvest time, you're going to pull up your potato. You may not get nothing at all. Oh. Uh, so, uh, so what what type of fish were we talking about again? What was so, the fish? Um, and the, this setup to be able to feed your garden plants is fresh water only. You cannot oh, use salt water. Okay. Salt water's, you know, Gonna salt water's the out of limit. Yeah. And another thing you need to know is you uh, it has to be untreated water. Uh, untreated as in no uh, antibiotics to treat fish diseases, no pH adjusters, no ammonia adjusters, because there are those type of adjusters. Right. So you need to be careful of that. What about a, what about if you were just to take rainwater off, like the roof of the garage or something, and just if it sits there, is that usually going to be fine? Well, the difference between rainwater and aquarium water is aquarium water is where all the nutrients is that the plants need to be able to uh, give them good kickstart in the beginning stages of their life. Right, right. Because rain, wa- rainwater is just water off of a roof. Right, but I mean, as you're taking the water out of the tank, you know, for the fish. What, oh, you know, oh talking- yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, when, when I water my garden, yeah, it's coming straight out of my fish tank. Yeah, okay. And then you back, can you backfill with with rainwater? You know, if you're a plastic no. collect tank? No, no top yeah. water. Okay. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and, and so when you say freshwater fish, is there one that in particular you use or you just use whatever you can get? Any freshwater fish will work. Mm-hmm. Any freshwater, it doesn't matter what type. But the thing you got to know about uh, keeping certain types of fish, okay, so my 36 gallon is Amazon tropical fish. They come from <clears throat> the Amazon River Basin. Angelfish, different types of mollies, they all get along. Now my 75, it's a different breed. I got African cichlids and South American cichlids, mm-hmm. which are both, the South American cichlids are strictly carnivorous, and the African cichlids are omnivores. And it doesn't matter, you could use the waste at any type of fish aquarium, except salt water, because the salt okay. will kill the plants. Right. <clears throat> the um, so if you're going to get a thousand pounds of potatoes, how I, I haven't grown potatoes before. Are we talking about? Um, are we t- talking about? Uh, um, well, how, let's put it this way: What's the dimensions of, of the potatoes that the garden you're able to grow in? Uh, actually, you'd be surprised. It's takes very little space to grow a thousand potatoes. Uh-huh. I'm growing in three. I'm growing in three different areas. Um, I got a big back porch. On one side of my porch, potatoes and um, watermelon radishes. On the other side, just potatoes. And in my main garden, in my backyard, I got onions and potatoes. And I would Oops. say it's 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 split fifty fifty okay. between Walla Walla sweets. And potatoes. Okay. And the amazing so, thing to produce a thousand pounds of potatoes, you're only looking maybe fifty bucks max in actual buying potato seeds. Yeah. And what what if you were to save some of your potatoes? Is there a way you can just use your potato to start the next season? Uh, 
<clears throat> by leaving them in the ground. And if yeah. you're in a cold environment, like if you, so one way you can do that is just uh, harvest, say, 90% of your crop. You can leave another 10% in the ground. Okay. And But now if you live in a climate that gets, I would say, below 10 degrees, uh-huh. the premier option to avoid those potatoes from freezing is I don't know the exact amount of how many dead leaves you would put on top. I'm assuming maybe 12 inches, maybe more like 18 inches. I've uh-huh. just like pulverized leaves out of your lawnmower, uh, grass clippings, probably put up a metal uh, gate around your garden area and just dump a lot of leaves on top because I'll keep the ground insulated more from freezing. Oh, okay. I have, I have yet to try that out, but I'm going to try it this year because like I said, I grew in Western Washington and my mom, she was born and she was born and raised on a milk farm. Uh-huh. She had a garden my entire life and she would harvest potatoes and next year they would always pop up again. The reason why Western Washington climate is much more mild, mild, milder than Eastern Washington. The coldest temperature in Western Washington, I think, was zero degrees at SeaTac back in, I'm going to say, the 1950s. Uh-huh. The coldest temperature here in Spokane ever observed was negative 30, I believe, back in 1890, back in the 1890s, I want to say. Uh-huh. But I'm going to try the, you know, just mulching of your leaves that fall on the ground. You know, I got a compost pile in the backyard, too, probably uh-huh. like 10 feet worth of uh, organic buildup. Just throw that on top. And then if next spring, if it works, you got more potatoes. You know what I mean? Definitely. So, so yeah, I mean, when... Kind of a lot. Kind of what we're looking at here is, you know, you know, kind of, you know, Diamond's perspective on all this is that, you know, there's going to come a time when you're going to need to grow your own food, <clears throat> you know, that, and, and that's kind of where I was coming at with the whole, you know, let's not use potato seeds. You know, can you use a, um, <clears throat> can you use some of the previous year's harvest to uh, produce the potatoes for the next year? Because, you know, it might not be potato seeds, you know, those are made somewhere and they get shipped and, and um, you know, I'm just kind of thinking, you know, as soon as you get the, uh, yeah, go ahead. An- another option I would suggest for that is harvest some potatoes, you know, potatoes out of that year's harvest, and then just <laughs> put them in a pretty cool to cold environment, I would say, if you can manage to get the temperature between... 37 and 40 first let them sprout and then put them in more of like um i'm gonna say like i don't know how cold a wine chiller gets or whatever but if you can manage to get them sprouted i would say maybe like two inches from the actual potato you'd have to do that inside at room temperature and then just keep them in a cool environment and that they will they should last until the next spring Oh, okay. Okay. Because the cold, the cold, the cold to cool air stops the potato from continuing its seeding process. If it's in room temperature, it will grow uh, the roots or the seed part that comes out of the potato. They can get up to like twelve inches tall. Right. <clears throat> Excellent. So, I mean, that's that's where I was coming from. Is you know. <clears throat> The, the two parts of the system that, that, you know, could be perfected for the future would be being able to, uh, you know, being able to create your own seeds for the next year. <clears throat> and then also being able to um, uh, have a way of getting fish that you don't have to get from so far away. You know, I mean, maybe you can, you know, maybe you can find, uh, well, there's, there's two things, you know, that, <clears throat> the, the first thing would be, you know, you start raising your own fish that you could sell and eat. And um, so have you tried raising your own fish at all, or do you normally just buy the fish for the, the refuse? That's actually funny that you should say that. Because I actually got, okay, so there's a beautiful South American fish called the jaguar. Uh-huh. You know what a python looks like, the colorations of a python, how it's 
kind of like bra black, silver, and some, uh, I'm going to say black, silver, and brown. Well, the right. Jaguar cichlid, I would have to say, resembles about the same colorations as a python. Well, I actually got two breeding pairs of Jaguar cichlids. I'm actually looking at the babies right now. And so I got two, two mating pairs of Jaguar cichlids. I'm looking at their babies. Next to the 75, I got a 10-gallon of babies that are probably about two, two months old. They're getting bigger. It just takes a while to get them big enough to be able to reinduce them back in the 75 because anything that fits in a carnivorous fish's mouth will get eaten. <laughs> so you got to, unfortunately, take the babies out at some point and raise them in a grow-up grow up tank. Oh, okay. Yeah, because that would be that that would be the second part to making your um, making your a whole process one that can live on is to have is to be able to reproduce the fish for yourself and to repro and then you could eat them of course and then uh, to um, be able to create the seeds uh, that you could use to um, uh, reproduce the the potatoes themselves so. You know, making it a, a cyclical, fully cyclical situation. And for be able to keep your potatoes in a chilled environment, not I would say no lower than like 34 degrees. My uh -huh. suggestion would be maybe like a, a hallway that leads from a garage door opening into another main room. Because, for instance, that's how it's like in my house. I got a hallway that leads from a downstairs room into the garage where it's enclosed. It gets pretty cold in there when it's like down 10 degrees outside, but I, it's probably about 34, maybe 35 degrees in that hallway. Yeah, I mean, where I'm at, that's not going to be an, an option to, to be able to, you know, save them that long. I would, I don't, I don't know. You got, a, you got a crawl space? No, uh -uh. You, oh, they, I was they, say if you got a crawl space, that'd be a good area. Yeah, they um, out here you dig down about an inch below the soil and you hit what's called caliche, and it's something between solid clay and, and rock. <laughs> you know, so it's it's a uh, not not very hospitable out here. I mean, people do grow things here, but um, you know, you're certainly going to have to build up your soil. You're not just going to go out in a field someplace and start. Uh, um, yeah, you're definitely. Your soil probably definitely has to be remineralized. Re it's a hard yeah. thing. Yeah, you're gonna. Um, you, you're definitely gonna have to. Uh, there's a word for it, but yeah, basically make it. Um, you know, put manure in and, and work the soil and get some critters in there. And um, uh, but anyway, yeah. So that that was just my thought. Yeah, I don't know. I guess I'll, I'll have to check around, but. I, I can't imagine how you would save a potato for six months in, in Arizona other than artificially, you know what I'm saying? You know, having the, some the, way the to only, well, You know, like I was saying earlier, the only thing I think possible is if you could somehow think of a way of the c coolest area that is dark, the seed potatoes shouldn't have no sunlight to them. Because sun, sunlight is also what makes them sprout. So a cool dark area uh -huh. like um if you're if you're if you can manage through uh the coming peril times that we're all faced if you can manage to keep a refrigerator going through let's say you got um uh what are they um uh, david's always talking about them solar panels on the roof and you got a <laughs> battery to be able to store power if you can somehow uh, get uh, some type of refrigeration unit, you know, uh, a chiller of some type, that's mm -hmm. another possibility. Yeah, I mean, you certainly could, you know, if you had a good quality type of refrigeration unit that you could, that would last. Um, there's another fellow that I that I follow, and, and he always talks about, you know, if you have one, you have none, and if you have... Uh, Two, you have one, you know. So his philosophy is if he's going to get something, he gets three of them. You know that way he's got he's got one and a backup. You know, yeah. Because one will yeah. certainly fail. 
right away. So, you know, I'm the exact same way. Yeah, I got about yeah. five of everything. Yeah. So, you, so you said that, you know you're you know you come from a growing background and the um, a very important you know we're talking about refrigeration, but you know why refrigerate when you can when you can uh, preserve right? What what yeah, is definitely. experience with with canning and 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 maybe drying you know uh, to preserve uh, meats and vegetables and fruits you know what kind of experience do you have with that? It's actually funny that you say that because about um, four or five months ago, I got really deep in the canning process. Oh, excellent. And excellent. I, got some, I got some information here to share with you that I think might actually shock you a little bit. Okay. I, just, I did some homework. I made a report. Almost feels like I'm back in high school. I love it. <laughs> excellent. Well informed. So, okay. Just finding it. No problem. Home canning facts. Here we are. Okay. Hydrated food loses the most nutrients compared to canned or frozen. Frozen foods will lose more nutrients than frozen storage period than home canned goods will. Hang on, I gotta turn on my light. It's pretty dark in my room. No problem. Home canned goods canned properly after harvest can be more nutritious than fresh produce you buy at a supermarket, except when it comes to the added sugar and sodium in them. Sugar and salt only add Completely fresh produce is best for vitamin C. Can can produce as soon as you are able to. Even in the refrigerator, half or more of some vitamins will be lost in a week or two. The the heat of canning will destroy one third to one half of these four vitamins: vitamin A, vitamin C, thiamine, and riboflavin. Other vitamins and minerals, however, are preserved close to fresh levels. Let me repeat myself on that. Fresh levels. After a year, vitamin loss of 5 to 20% per year, depending on what vitamin you're looking at. Canned products should always be stored in cool and dark locations. The excess heat of a hot summer day may cause a location to develop enough heat for dormant bacteria to start growing. When canned goods are frozen, then thawed, the texture may change, but the food is still safe to eat. Be sure the seal is intact. Canned foods will keep for an indefinite period of time. I'm sorry, i got to repeat myself on that. Canned foods will keep for an indefinite period of time, as long as the seal is intact and they have been properly processed. After canning your food, tap the top. You should hear a ringing note. If food is touching the top, this may not occur, but as long as the top does not move up and down, the food does not have to be processed again. Black deposits that are occasionally found on the underneath side of the lid are usually nothing to worry about. As long as the jar is st still sealed and are, properly, and, and are probably caused by tanniness in the food or by hydrogen sulfide, released by foods during their processing. And that's it. That's all I got for that. Mm -hmm. Is your phone, are you using a cell phone? No, home phone. Oh, okay. It was, it was breaking up a little bit. But <clears throat> no, that that's, I mean, that's the thing people always wonder, you know, oh, if I put it in a can, you know, it'll probably last a year or two, and if I, when I open it and eat it, it'll kill me. <laughs> is, is that, that's not, the norm, no. I mean, that's just everyone's fear, right? Yeah, that is everybody's fear because I, I, I started uh, canning potatoes. This is I, I bought my canner. I, I want to say back in like February this year, started mm -hmm. canning potatoes. I actually opened a jar like a week ago. Fine, 
And then I was kind of iffy on start canning meats, but I canned mm-hmm. chicken. I okay. had chicken. I had chicken in my cupboard canned for like four months. Opened it, ate it. Nothing happened. I didn't die of botulism. That's the biggest fear when canning meat. If it's not canned process, you can contract botulism from it. But long as the seal isn't intact, and when you press on the top, long as, long as there's no motion in it and it's solid, like touching a uh, su- uh, surface of a countertop, you're good. Excellent. It's canned, it's Excellent. sealed. <clears throat> um. So, so that's um, now. Is the canning and it, is that uh, just something that you started, or is that something that you picked up from your family as you're growing up, or you you saw your mom doing it and didn't think anything about it till now? No, I totally started it on my own. My mom, she she grew up on a dairy farm. However, uh, she n- knew all about how to organically grow a garden from scratch. To say. So, I mean, she never taught me how to can. I just uh, informed myself via YouTube. And I'm mm-hmm. eating canned chicken out of the can that's been sitting in my cupboard for a month. Could you imagine trying to eat raw chicken, get out of the grocery store, and you just throw it in your cupboard? <laughs> totally. You're, you're probably going to die. Yeah. yeah. And, and sir, are there other vegetables that are easier to uh, – or are vegetables easier – than say meats or safer you know if you don't want to take that chance you want to you want to get some calories and you have some nutrition but you don't want to take the chance I, I think a lot of people will have you know chickens and and pigs and bunnies and stuff you know when when the if, if the uh, hammer ever falls but so I don't know you know that the protein is the most important thing I think the thing that might be hard is you know when things get cold is is to be able to have uh um, you know, if you have potatoes, you have calories, but you don't have your, your, uh, you, you want to have your, uh, um, you want to get your vitamins too. So, um, th- what, what are your thoughts about, you know, the, the different types of foods that you can, um, are, are there, I guess my question, are there more safer plants to can than, than not? I guess that's what I'm wondering. Well, any, any vegetable that you can, uh, will not get botulism. It's just meat. Okay. Yeah, you don't got to worry about botulism from canning any type of fruits or vegetables. Well, no vegetables, but uh, fruits, it's it's the more acidic things. You want to kind of, I, I wouldn't recommend canning, say, a can of like raspberries that has a lot of acidity in it and then opening it like 30 years later. It's it's the acid and the acidity in the the vegetable and or fruit that has high concentrates of it that I would have to say the only thing that probably wouldn't keep for an indefinite period of time is high-based acidic uh, foods. Okay, so keep the less acidic, the better, as far as from a yeah. safety perspective. Yeah. yeah. yeah um, right. Well, Jake, hold on one second here. I'm going uh, to – uh, I did get the number for our other guest. And uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna see if I can't wrangle them up right now. <clears throat> um, let's hold on one second here. I'll give them a, a jingle. We'll uh, add them to the call and see what uh, see what we come up with here. Um, so we're we're looking for uh, um, Carrie uh, Carrie Peterson. He should be joining us here in a second. So we'll see if it works. Cool. I'm anxious. Uh, Hello? Is this Carrie? It is. Hi, Carrie. This is Scott McDonough, and uh, I'm with the Oppenheimer Project. And and um, right now we're sitting here talking with Jake. You've probably been listening in, correct? Maybe? <laughs> I've, been, I've been able to catch pieces and parts of it. Okay, okay, good, good. Um, yeah, I apologize catching up with you right now. I just uh, I, I started rolling the show, and I'm like looking for the phone numbers and I'm like going, I only have one of my two phone numbers here. So, so anyway, I did, I, <laughs> so I rounded it up and I, and, uh, and just now and I, and, uh, so here we are, uh, we still have plenty of time left. We're, we're only 40 minutes in. So, um, you're fine. So I've, I've, no talk, problem. Yeah. Yeah. I've been, uh, I, I've been talking with Jake so far and, um, it, it, you know, if you've been listening in, you know, we've been talking about, 
of food, and you're going to be coming in and out from a little different angle too. Um, and so far, we've been discussing uh, um, kind of a kind of a hybrid of hydroponics. You know, kind of a it, they're not directly feeding each other, but you know, it's 99% of the way there. So you know, Jake is he's got the fish. He's he's got the he's collecting the uh, the goodies from the fish, and he's giving it to his potatoes, and uh -huh. he's getting quite a collection of uh, of uh, potatoes. You know, giving you a good a good amount of carbohydrates. And, um, and so we, we were talking about, you know, those items and, and, and also talking about what do you do when you get done, you know, gathering your food, you know, we've talked a little bit about canning and, um, and, you know, some of the do's and don'ts for that. So, um, I, I guess what I'd like to do is, is, um, um, I think I'm getting close to where I want to bring in, um, um, bring in Diamond and, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see what. What Diamond has to say here. Let me let me flip over to him and see if he's chit chatting with me here. Oh, um, sounds great. Yeah. How are you so, doing, Gary? Hey, Diamond, how are you? No, this is Jake. That's Jake. Yep. Jake, how are you, Jake? Yep. I just wanted and, to say uh, hello. Yeah. Oh, well, thanks. Nice, nice to talk to you guys. Okay. And um, so, actually, this is good timing because now I I can get uh, Diamond in the mix here too. So. Um, what what I want to what I would like to do real quick while I'm bringing Diamond in is um, yeah so you're you're with the group you're you're with Edible and Medical Plants of, of Idaho and Utah the, you yeah know, they're, they're, a, they're, yeah there's a I, probably go ahead oh I was just gonna say uh, yeah I run a Facebook page off of um, on Edible and Wild Edible and Medicinal Plants of Idaho and Utah and the reason I started that. Uh, Facebook page is because I'm getting back out in the field now and trying to rediscover our plants that are here and uh, native and very useful to us around the around our valley. And I wanted a place to uh, make a repository of all the information I was rehashing as I came across it. And uh -huh. so that's kind of why I started that that page there. Oh, okay, okay. And so, how long has it been since you? Um, you know, well, I guess the question was, what were you doing before you got reinterested in, in this? <laughs> well, I've always been interested, actually, but I have not been active due to work and play and all the other things. And, you know, with the coming changes coming on, now is a perfect time to get back out there and relearn, you know, everything around you, you know, because being human, our memories fail us after time. So, mm -hmm. you know, you, you may have a lot of information in your head, but if you don't rehash that and reconnect the synopses, then you, you know, that, that information is lost to you. So I've kind of always been involved in the plants. I always go out and get supplies for winemaking and whatnot, but I'm getting more back into the food that we're going to need to survive in the coming times. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of the coming times, I think it's time for Diamond to come. Are you there, Diamond? I am here, guys. Thank you all for joining me. I'm sorry I couldn't make it earlier. Uh, Carrie, sorry about the snafu with the phone number. And Jake, welcome <laughs> to the show. Thank you, Don. Uh, let's, yeah, I've been able to catch a couple minutes on the way back here of what uh, we've been talking about. And it was nice to hear how one of our listeners, Jake, is using, uh, you know, the the dumbed-down, bastardized version of aquaponics, which anyone can use. All you need is a fish tank and fish poop and some fish water urine inside the water, and you just water your plants with what the fish are making. You can always add fresh water into the fish tank and get the good stuff out. So that's kind of like a, you know, a beginner's model of what aquaponics is. You use the nitrogen from the urine, the fecal material is the food products, and you're actually starting to close up a biodynamic system which then translates into Carrie's work in the, the wilderness. Now, forest systems, permaculture principles, this is the way to the fu of the future because forests have always been able to produce uh, all of the food that they need, their own nutrients, and it has to do with the way that the forests are layered. So we're starting to incorporate these in our own farming techniques, as Jake's doing with his fish poop on his potatoes, and Carrie, uh, we should really get into discussing wild edibles because the future is going to be uh, ripe with collecting wild foods. 
Wild foods are going right. to be the key to surviving and thriving. And just like you said, you, you, you were dabbling in it because, and people in the last five to ten years have been dabbling in wild edibles. It is, in fact, become trendy, and you could pay tons of money for ramps at a fancy restaurant in Philly or other strange wild edibles. But uh, I'm interested to hear you sent me a nice bulleted list on the, some topics you wanted to talk about. And so real quick, if you could, uh, you know, give us some information on the history of edible and medicinal plants in general, if you do have a background on it, uh, what is your knowledge on the history of these plants and how come we're not using them anymore? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's a lot of reasons why there is, you know. Um, we've got mar modern pharmaceuticals now. We've got the silver bullets that can cut right through to the diseases, even though they're not necessarily the best for your body. So we have these silver bullets. We have cultivated plants that we have completely changed from their wild forms, and they're less nutrient-dense. They taste better to us, so they're more palatable and more sellable. And so I think that's one of the reasons why we've kind of gotten away for it, from it. But, you know, the, our history of wild plants goes back some 60,000 years. Uh, there was a cave discovered in Georgia, and they found within the burial, um, they found floral, um, floral parts of yarrow. They found cornflower. They found bachelor buttons, thistles, um, hollyhocks. And in those plants, just in those, you have diuretic stimulants, astringents, anti-inflammatories. You have all sorts of different chemicals. And that was 60,000 years ago. We also have discovered wow, that, uh, dyed flax women so back, back 36,000 years ago. Say, that is uh -huh. truly amazing. That, it, it absolutely is. It fascinates me every time I think about it. You know, here we were, a primitive people, not even doing agriculture. We were still hunters and gatherers, and yet here we had a pharmacopoeia that we were drawing from. It's just, it's just fascinating. And so, you know, that, that comes down to the, the next stage, which is the first written um, evidence of medicinal plants, and that was the Sumerians. That was 5,000 years ago. They had formulas. They had some 700 different entries into the cuneiforms that we have found so far just on medicinal plants. And, you know, it's just a fascinating history that it goes back so far. The Egyptians were involved in it. Um, it goes clear back to Chinese, um, early ancient Chinese um, medicinal use. They have the longest tradition, unbroken tradition, that goes back some 2,000 years. So, you know, we have a very, very long history of uh, using these plants. And I think it's it's a shame that in our modern society we've gotten away from those wild plants. Well, yeah, in the past, wild plants were the key to survival. And what I mean is if we go back to 60,000 years ago, the way that Native Americans, uh, Native uh, earthlings from all around the world at that time, and it's funny, I said Native North Americans. We, we think that people have only been in North America 14 or 16,000 years. That's a total farce. The, in mm -hmm. fact, what's missing is the archaeological evidence because catastrophic events occur in regular periodic events which wipe off the evidence off the earth or put it under hundreds of meters of ocean water, which is the current case. Currently, we're at the highest sea levels uh, attainable on the planet. Sea level can only rise another 165 feet, maybe, but it is literally hundreds of feet higher than it usually is. So in the last few million years, sea level was hundreds of feet lower, and all of the missing civilizations are all underwater, and we're simply missing. We, we don't dive off the coast. It's impossible to do archaeology at 300 feet. It, it just costs millions of dollars an hour. So we're not getting the archaeological information to tell us more. But what we do know is that the people that were walking around that time were using medicinal plants 60,000 years ago, and they learned it from the other animals. One right, of the most right. intriguing uh, medicines in this area is OSHA. It's all over above 10,500 feet, and it has many uh, very specific medicinal properties that bring health to many people in this region by using what they call bear medicine. And mm -hmm. it was 
found out by watching bears. Sick bears would go harvest the osher root and eat it. And that's where, it all, that's where medicinal plant knowledge comes from, observing nature. Can you speak a little bit to that, uh, Carrie? Oh, right, right. You're absolutely right. That's the one story about the bear medicine, um, is that they discovered that by watching the bears. Um, we have evidence of chimpanzees eating special fruits that they have that if they don't get them in captivity, they end up with cirrhosis of the liver. I mean, we have um, animals who, in fact, today I was just watching a documentary and they were talking about the Utah prairie dog. And here that Utah prairie dog was munching on the tips of tansy mustard. Well, tansy mustard is an antimicrobial, antifungal. So they are probably treating themselves for some kind of intestinal parasite. (laughs) And it's just, so it is see, amazing. Uh, that When we see rats in the New York City subways not eating a McDonald's hamburger, what should we glean from that? <laughs> <laughs> it's certainly not well, good for us. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I've literally seen dozens of rats walk over top of hamburgers sitting in the bottom of subway tunnels. And you're looking at that. And this is 20 years ago. I haven't eaten at McDonald's since then, trust me. Because if a rat doesn't think that that's food... Why are humans eating it? Right. <laughs> We're not no, the smartest of all creatures sometimes. <laughs> humans are lazy by nature. Yeah, indeed. Uh, Scott, do you have anything to chime in? Um, I guess that in my mind, the, the thing that, that I get a little confused with, and maybe you guys can clear it up, is you know, I, I've read books before where they talk about the hunter-gatherer communities you know, of the last 10,000 years. And, you know, you, we're talking about before, it, it, basically the, the previous ice age maybe finished 10, 12,000 years ago. Is, is that kind of sound right? Yeah, that, that's the end. Of, that's the Younger Dryas event. There's, so when we're going back 60,000 years, there have been three glacial maximums in between there. Okay. So, so it seems like we keep getting thrown back into being a hunter-gatherer because... You know, we had hunter-gatherers just 100, 200 years ago that we could go and study, and, and plenty of people did that. And and, and, I, and it seems as if there were there may have been previous high cultures, but maybe not technological. It seems as but, if. Well, yeah, well, I'm, I'm easing let's into just, it. Let's, <laughs> let's just end the nonsense. There definitely was higher cultures. If we just go through the GISP to ice core data, and, and the known, you know, we, w- the known history that we're lied to about in schools, we are learn that farming began 5,000 years ago. That's a lie. And we know that now because Gobegli Tepe, which dates back further than 11,000, is clearly an advanced cosmological society. Someone that can create advanced cosmological markers clearly was, had knowledge of farming at that time. So the Gobegli Tepe uh, archaeological site itself is clear evidence that high cultures existed for tens of thousands of years and that our current knowledge is uh, unacceptable. And more importantly, we know that empires have risen and fallen over the last 3,000 years. So 3,000 years ago, the Minoans, 2,000 years ago, the Romans, 1,000 years ago, the Vikings, these are major cultures that survived and thrived during warm periods, and in between there are nightmare periods, the Goths, the Huns, the Dark Ages. So we're looking at smaller-scale versions of larger-scale events. In our clear history of the last five to 10,000 years, we have seen empires rise and fall every 1,000 years. When you go to the next level of cosmic catastrophe, it is the 11,500-year cycle. And so that is killing the entire ideas that have been created in the entire 10,000 years prior. And what I mean by that is all the empires we've seen in the last three to 5,000 years are very similar. We build these amazing structures. We have huge cities. There's plumbing. They're all similar. 
the empires that existed prior to this in the last ice age were probably a different type of empire. One that maybe didn't, that built only megalithic structures and all the people were hunter gatherers. So there is so much history we don't know, but there's a lot of information that is being discovered daily in the last few decades and it really needs to be reworked. Does that help at all, Scott? Yeah, and, and so kind of the point I was getting at is it seems like, you know, just from, um, you know, built in the ancient part of our brain is this emergency backup wild edibles capability where we know how to fall back and become hunter-gatherers even if we do form into these uh, greater societies and and create high culture in farming, it seems like the ability for us to go back and become hunter gatherers and to and to and to become aware of our surroundings, the what the bears eating, what the you know, and and what we can find and and uh, to be stay healthy ourselves, you know, the wild edibles. It seems that it's kind of built into us to rediscover that each time a society fails or we well, go through it. I'd, I'd, I'd like to chime in on that if you don't mind. Sure. Well, um, we're about to go to yeah. a break. Who's that? Who just was speaking? <laughs> this is Carrie. Yeah. I just wanted to chime in on that when we get back. Carrie, we're <laughs> hitting a break. So you come in right after the break. We have five minutes to stay quiet. We have a commercial break. And then when we come back, Carrie's going to chime in on our ancient knowledge on wild edibles, and then we're going to get into some ethical wild crafting. So guys, stick with us, and uh, for those of you that are joining us on the chat right now, just be quiet until we come back to the show. And that's a boom. It's your mute. into a world unseen on Raven Star's Witching Hour. You will encounter eclectic topics from the realm of spirit brought into our matrix of truth. With your host, the Solaris Blue Raven, Solaris will bring you an array of unique guests covering topics from ghostly spirits to amazing anomalies, covert technology, UFOs, and shadowy global events. And that's right here at Revolution Radio Freedom Slips.com, Saturdays, midnight till 2 a.m. Eastern Time. Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps. Let the magic rise. <laughs> Join me weekdays for my new show, Tell Chris Joe. This is going to be a problem show brought to you live from Kensington. Thursdays, I'm dealing with hot topics, heated debate, what's new around the world, and ring-ins to discuss listeners' problems and offering considered and heartfelt solutions. So join me, Chris Hart, for Tell Chris Joe. Stop what you're doing, grab a cup of tea, and coming live from Kensington, relax. Let me entertain you with a coffee bar online. Listeners, very personal problems. So that's Thursdays, 2 p.m. in the afternoon, Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. See you there. It's going to be lots of fun. This is Barbara DeLong, host of Nightlight Radio, inviting you to join me on a cosmic journey. Exploring a metaphysical montage of spiritual material, covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between, including spiritual readings for those who seek enlightenment. Let Nightlight provide you with equal measure of light, love and laughter, insight, wisdom, and inspiration. Monday nights, 10 to 12 p.m. Eastern, right here on Studio B, Revolution Radio, at freedomslips.com.
The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host... Good evening, folks. This is Diamond with the Oppenheimer Ranch Project, bringing you the second hour of the Inconvenient Truth, prepping for the Grand Solar Minimum. Tonight with us on air is Jake Ryder from Spokane, Washington. Uh, Joining Jake is Carrie Peterson of Edible and Medicinal Plants of Idaho and Utah, and our producer, Scott McDonough. And when we just got cut off at the commercial break, Carrie was talking about medicinal plants, specifically about how ancient cultures use them. Carrie, sorry you got cut off, and what were we talking about? (laughs) No, that's fine. Um, I just wanted to touch on the last comment that was being made about how humans seem to be able to fall back on our native plants to be able to survive when we come out of these interglacials, or come out of the glacial periods into the interglacials. And I think this time around, we're at a severe disadvantage because we have lost that oral tradition we have lost that depository of knowledge that we had as ancient peoples. We, this, there's still tribes in, that are untouched. There's still the Aborigines. There's still Native American people who continue those traditions, and they will be much better equipped than we are to go back into these times because they, are, they, they know what's around them. They, they are aware of what's around them. They're not, they're not going to the supermarket and getting their food off the shelf. You know, they, they are living the life. And, you know, modern agriculture only goes back some 9,000 years. So there must have been a skill set there when we came out of the last glacial period to be able to pick up and begin our modern agriculture once more. And I, and I just wanted to, you know, make that point that I think we as a species this time around are, are really, really, really unprepared for this. Yeah, and in fact, historically, the most unprepared that we are aware of of, simply because of the population density. The dumbing down of the populace is well documented during the fall of the Roman Empire. That's where the term nothing to see here comes from, because there was everything to see. If you have enough distraction, no one sees the empire crumbling, and then the people all die quickly, because they don't know how to take care of themselves. And in this instance, the effects are going to be exponential uh, because the majority of the populace that thinks that they're advanced and that they're well-adjusted through technology is absolutely living on a crutch. And if the plug gets pulled, they will panic and die like, like insects flying into a bug zapper. The people that live in third world countries, however, they're not even going to know the difference. They're not attached to a grid. They won't even going to, they're not going to know that there's global unrest and that there are people eating each other. They're just going to be going about their day. (laughs) Right. (laughs) What, you mean we're not going to get the internet? No, there will be no No. internet. (laughs) Carrie, I mean, is is that your name, Carrie? (laughs) Yes, sir. Okay, so I so did you say you grow wild edibles? Um, I'm mostly a forager, but I do have experience in growing um, various supplies of them. You know, I grow the common ones. Now, here's a quick question for you. I'm not sure. In the growing process, do you fertilize with A to Z rock dust? Because in addition Definitely. to me, yeah, in addition to me uh, fertilizing my garden with uh, aquarium waste, I also fertilize A to Z rock dust. I got some information here. The oldest, yes, azomite. Okay, okay, the oldest, older than the Stone Age, and most effective fertilizer, overlooked or even unheard of by most gardeners. Rock dust is just what you think. Um, different types of rock ground into fine powder, uh, smaller than 200 meshes. When added to the soil, it causes <laughs> regeneration. No, yeah. So Jake, Jake, so can I, Jake? Let me cut it. Let me cut in here. Rock dust. This is not a new thing. This is what being used sixty thousand years ago by the native mm-hmm. cultures that were growing food. 
All you need to do is set up your farm where there is a continental divide or a glaciers, and in the spring when the glaciers melt, the rivers run white. The reason the rivers are white is they're filled with rock dust. So all the original cultures that we find that where all the farming began, and I know, Carrie, you keep wanting to say farming began, you know, 9,000 years ago. There's evidence that they were farming 40,000 years ago, a uh, hemp at the edge of a glacier. Even 60,000 years ago, there could have been cultivation of some plants. And the reason that they were successful at these glacial margins, Jake, is because of the rock dust in the spring runoff. Oppenheimer Ranch, we are on the Blanco River, which translates to White River, which is 11 miles from the source on the Continental Divide. So in the spring, this water runs white, and when we irrigate with it, we are supplying the crops with hundreds of pounds of free azomite. So there is no need to buy that crap from a corporation. And they sell it wonderfully by giving you that explanation, but it's simply sourcing ancient knowledge, and now a corporation has capitalized on it and has cut you off from the natural source, and now you have to buy it for a dollar a pound. It's absolutely insane. If you know where to get your water, you could simply rent a truck and get 16,000 gallons of azomite-laden water every spring by driving into the mountains. What do you think of that, what Gary? What I was saying, <laughs> right. what, yeah, what go I was saying is that I garden with um, organic aquarium waste, and I also put in addition as my rock this. I understand where you're coming from, Diamond. It's free. I just uh, thought it would be good because this is only my second year of gardening. So if you are really... Yeah, azomite is the number one product, and I just explained why. It has every single micronutrient that the earth makes ground up into powder. What that does for your plants is it's like a multivitamin. At any moment they need something, it's in the soil. So it's a no-brainer. It is a lost knowledge that's, that's so common sense. I don't know how we have to relearn it from a company that sells rock dust. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm kind of fortunate in the area I am in. I'm at the about 600 foot below the high level of a Peruvian lake that is uh, drained and refilled 28,000 or 28 times over the last 800,000 years. Yeah. So there's there's deposits in my local area that I can go to and pick up met montmorillonite like clay, which is basically what azomite is. It's full of nutrients. It's full of minerals. That's a tough word. <laughs> that is a very tough word. Like I said, I can butcher Latin like no other. <laughs> yeah, so this is a good point, Kerry. And Jake, listen to what Kerry's saying. You can get some local geology books and locate your own rock dust. That's what these companies have done, and they're literally ripping you off because that stuff is super expensive. And it's much well, better say, if you uh, take... Yeah. I got like 10 pounds off of it on Amazon, like $16, and my mom bought it. $1.60 a pound for du- rock dust. No, no, well, yeah, yeah. No, I'm trying to remember. It was... It That's was, the right price. Was, I know the price of that dust. It's Even yeah. if you buy it in bulk for hundreds of acres, you can get it down to $0.80 cents a pound, which is not cost-effective for organic gardening. I mean, it costs like 50000 an acre to use rock dust. That's a lot. Very much so. <laughs> but it does last for quite some time to give it, you know, a little bit of credibility. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, because it's, not enough it's for the bioavailable, car, so it's not being used up. It's only being used in you know, small amounts throughout the mm-hmm. depending on the plants. Now, let's talk – so here's the problem. Scott brought up this uh, innate knowledge humans have about this wild edibles and even wild crafting. And – then you you wrote that one of your topics you wanted to talk about was ethical wild crafting, Carrie. Now the problem with wild edibles becoming trendy is people are going out and raping the forests. The uh, eastern ginseng has almost been harvested to extinction in the Appalachians, and other wild edibles like ramps and other things like OSHA are being unsustainably harvested, which means that they may not exist in the future we're going into. So ethical wildcrafting in general was practiced by humanity. The humanity that's living on Earth knows nothing of ethical anything.
<laughs> so I think that the same thing happened during um, the Great Depression will happen during the, this grand solar minimum, the eddy minimum, is that the forests are going to be harvested clean almost instantly of all animals and edible wildlife. What say you? Right. Yeah, I agree. You know, you have to, you have to um, really make a point of being ethical when you're out there. You, the first thing you want to do is make sure you're not going after any protected or endangered species, number one. Idaho yes. has five of those, so we have to be you know, watchful for those. You also want to make sure that you're not harvesting any plants that are rare in the particular location you're in. You know, if there's less than 10 in a location, don't take any. If there's more than 10 there, you know, take less than 10%. You know, it's, it's, it's about making sure that the forest is sustainable when you leave. Is, is your harvesting going to make the population better or worse? You know, if it's going to make it worse, walk away from it. Find, find another spot. You know, if you're doing, um, if you're taking the whole plant, like I said, 10%. If you're doing tops, you know, you can go up to a third. But make sure that you're not taking away from the wildlife around around the population. Also, you want to make sure to leave the biggest and healthiest plants. Those are known as the grandmothers and grandfathers. Those are the ones that are, that are producing the seed. The, they have been a lot, around a lot longer and withstood the elements. They are stronger. They have a tighter... Um, more diverse genetic um, bank to draw from. So you want to leave your biggest plants. You want to also um, make sure when you're harvesting something like roots or something, leave a portion of the top of the root there. Harvest the back part of the root and leave the front part and plant it back in the dirt. Put a little offering of tobacco like the Indians used to put in there. The thing about tobacco is it's a, it's a, it's a hyper accumulator of minerals and nutrients. So what the Native Americans were doing is they were fertilizing the plant when they were putting the tobacco offerings down there as a spiritual offering. You know, if you're going out and, you know, make the place better when you leave the area. You know, if you're digging plants, fill in your holes. If you're harvesting leaves and you need leaving the stems, make sure you break them up small so they can compost down a lot faster. And, you know, like I said, just make sure that you are protecting our environment and leaving it better for the next ones to come along. It's funny right. that you mention. I'm sorry for cutting you off, uh, Diamond, but I think it's uh, funny that you mentioned that the Native Americans uh, give offerings. I mean, I, I've, I, since growing my garden, I've just had this internal instinct to talk to my garden and play peaceful music to it because I realize it's, going to be growing me the nutrients that I'm going to need to sustain myself through this coming cold time that we're all facing. Mm-hmm. Right. If you don't that's take care of nature, that's, that's not going to take care of you. And every time I go, I, I walk 15,000 steps in the morning and 15,000 steps in the evening. And when it's daylight out, I always got a, like an Albertson's trash bag with me. I'm picking up trash that people just discard. It's just so disgusting. I don't drive, so I walk everywhere. So I feel like that um, I'm repaying it back to Mother Nature for all the abundance that she has given to me. That's a very another, that's a, yeah another item that uh, that I had heard uh, heard about was the hunter gatherer when you know they they would cover you know they. Kind of the number that they would always end up with would be, you know, around 50 people in a group, and it always kind of hovered around that number. And if you got if you got too many more, they tended to split off, and if they got too small, then they tended to disappear because they didn't have enough uh, coverage for all the different um, um, jobs that were would be in a in a group. Um, <clears throat> but one thing that was interesting that that I remember reading was that uh, honey was kind of the um, the choice item uh, and was was owned by the the uh, leader of the group it, it was and and so in their territory that they would go around they might go to that hive maybe once a year maybe twice a year and they would do a similar thing that you were saying they would treat that hive with respect they would go and just take a small portion portion of it and eat it but they wouldn't destroy the hive they wouldn't you know, ransack it. They would just take a portion of Absolutely. it and enjoy it. And then, then the next time they came around, there the, that group would still be somewhere in the area. But that you know, that hive was was uh, was, was treated with respect, and it was a prized possession. 
Absolutely. Right. Um, so, so, you, so we were, um, you know, we were talking about the fact that that we are losing um, that that we've become dumbed down, and that we are losing this ability um, to take care of ourselves. And it, it, probably a lot of people that are listening to this conversation, um, and certainly us included, you know, we are doing things to uh, better our chances in the future. You know, we're you know, Jake is uh, growing his potatoes and, and um, you know, I've said on previous occasions, you know, I've got uh, fruit trees growing and, and I just had my first apple off my apple tree uh, today, as a matter of fact. And, um, but, you know, I've got uh, beans and, and strawberries and, and cherry tomatoes. So, you know, two, year, two years ago I started, I killed everything. Last year, a couple of things survived, but there was nothing to eat. And now this year, I actually am eating things. So it, it, it's um, a thing I would tell everyone, you know, um, start your garden, start your potatoes, get some fish and, you know, try the hydroponics. You know, the you, you don't have to, you know, like Jake was showing, you don't have to have a huge tanks and expensive pumps and recycling systems. You just, just takes a little extra manual labor. And, um, right. And and from a, a wild edibles perspective, um, are you are you familiar with the different environments that are that you would find at least in the United States here? Um, I, I know this probably goes all all, all around the world, but um, are you particular to the uh, Northwest, or are you kind of knowledgeable in um, in many regions? Well, I tend to concentrate in the Rocky Mountain Range type plants and the Great Basin type plant um, okay. type areas. Be and the only reason why that is is because those are my local flora. You know, those are the those are the plants I'm going to be able to draw off of. Now, back uh, 15 years ago, I moved to North Carolina, and that gave me an opportunity for 10 years to go out there and study some of the eastern plants. The first thing I did when I got back there was purchase the eastern edition of the Peterson Field Guide, which is probably the best field guide you can find for medicinal and edible plants. Oh, and okay. so I did learn a little bit about the systems back there, not as much as I would like to, but, um, you know, we're, we're really fortunate in this area right here in that we go from 4,500 feet up to a little over 9,000. So we have everything from prairies to foothills to montane to subalpine. So I can draw from many different uh, microclimates and systems for for the plant material I need. So, what would be uh, obviously there's going to be different things found found at different times of the year. If we were just oh, to kind of break it into the four seasons, you know, what would you what would be the primary um, uh, plant or berry that you might look for in each season? Well. <clears throat> Right now in this area, um, I've just been out doing an assessment of what's available right now, and there's right around 30 edible plants right now. The spring is your best time to find your greens, of course. Okay. Um, your your more um, flower and stem flowering stem parts that you would eat, um, things like burdock stalks that come up, those will be more in the summer, and those are eaten a lot like um, a replacement for um, artichoke. And, you know, when you start getting into the fall season, then, you know, of course, your berries come on. We have a, quite a selection here. We've got currants. We've got gooseberries. We've got um, thimbleberries that are more in the summer, not quite in the fall. But then you have, you know, your elderberry, which is an amazing plant. It is a good food, food source. It has been proven to be more effective than Tamiflu against the flu. And, you know, it makes a delicious wine, too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are a winemaker, definitely, definitely. Well, let me chime in here real quick. So, Scott, to answer your question and all those listening, wild edibles, get a, eat the weeds, get the book, eat the weeds. And what you're going to find is that the 10 major wild edibles that everyone can learn how to identify instantly and can be used medicinally and for food are located everywhere in the Northern Hemisphere. They're located from 20 degrees uh, north of the equator to 20 degrees south of the North Pole. We're talking things like plantain, garlic, mustard, standard wild edibles, nodding onion. These are things that kept settlers 
and explorers alive as they did their searches. They grow almost everywhere, and even in the desert where Kerry is, as he's traversing between 4,000 and 10,000 feet, somewhere around 6,600 feet next to a creek, he's going to find plantain, he's going to find stinging nettle and garlic mustard in the same desert as he did in New Jersey. (laughs) Isn't that true, Kerry? (laughs) Oh, yeah, absolutely. And not only that, but the harvest seasons are different with the altitude as well. What what we have down here in the valley at 4,500 foot, Two weeks later, we'll be we'll be in prime condition up about six thousand, seven thousand foot. You know, so right. elevation will really extend your season, also for these edible plants as well. Yeah, we have this wild mint, the original mint. It comes out of the creeks here as they drop down. It grows right out of the creek beds. It's the original menta, which is what you make uh, pure uh, essential oil of mint from, which has got calming effects. It's just an amazing product. But when it starts being harvested here, we have five weeks of harvest. We just keep going up higher and higher. And by you know July, we're up at 10,000 feet, but you we're still harvesting the mint. Right. Don't forget about wild mushrooms. Mm. Those those are great, too. Yeah, now the problem with mushrooms and any wild edible is you need to make sure you know what you're yeah. harvesting before you eat it. It will kill you. It will kill you. <laughs> Absolutely. That's another yeah. thing. As, as Sorry, far as Paul Stamets is concerned, which is the foremost authority on wild mushrooms, if you're a wild mushroom collector, you need to cook all wild mushrooms before you ingest them. There are no wild mushrooms that you can eat safely uncooked. There are some that you can eat safely uncooked, but there's no reason to try because all varieties of wild mushrooms can have some toxins within them if they're raw. And you don't know if that patch of morels has the toxin in it versus this one. So make sure you cook all your wild mushrooms at only for five minutes at 165. That's all you need to do. It's a quick saute. Right. And, I'm, you know, it's funny you bring up Paul Stamets. He's, he's gotten himself in a little bit of hot water talking about the need for uh, cooking mushrooms. I know he kind of got come after by the uh, portobello industry <laughs> at one point. <laughs> He's talking about wild versions, not cultivated versions. Mm-hmm. Because we, there are wild versions of, of currently no mushrooms that can be growing in toxic environments. Like I har- harvest oyster mushrooms all the time. They're the safest, easiest to identify. They grow on stumps. But I still cook them because it could be a tainted stump or a microbial area that has more mycotoxins that come into that standard mushroom. And all you have to do is heat it, and it goes away. So why wouldn't you cook your mushroom? Totally. Right. Yeah. The same thing for wild edibles. If you don't know what it is you're eating, don't harvest it and eat it. Because the, the story of the kid up in Alaska who ate the wrong wild edible and died when he didn't have to. So there are the basic wild edibles like plantain, garlic mustard, the burdocks, which actually take multiple cooking processes to become edible, some of the burdocks, but they're easy to identify. There are no poisonous mimics, and there is a safe way to get started with wild edibles if you go after plants. I wouldn't go after mushrooms in the beginning. If you're interested in mushrooms, find a uh, mushroom collecting group in your area and go join the meetup. Absolutely. I'm not even comfortable with collecting fungi for the most part. Well, in the Rocky Mountains, it's easy because you have the giant bolette. I mean, it's the only 17-inch mushroom (laughs) like it. So when you find one of those Smurf mushrooms, you know you're golden. All the morels are easily identifiable if they're the golden style. And they have seldom have mimics if they're growing in the right location, meaning in grass, under cottonwoods, etc. So there are mm. a few mushrooms you can be happy collecting, like ink caps and puff balls, and you're pretty much dead on uh, a safe mushroom. Right. But do your homework, please. Speaking of homework, Absolutely. what was the, that book again? The, the again. Weeds. What was the name of that book again? The weeds. Eat the weeds. Eat the weeds. Let me look that up. Oh, and I want to chime in about that. Go ahead. You know, in in doing a little bit of research for this um, for this show, I I was looking at just common yard weeds that they that um, you know Monsanto wants you to go out and spray, 
And they're all HGTV. HGTV. <laughs> yeah, H- I was just going to say that. HGTV has a list of the 12 most common uh, weeds that they want you to get rid of and control. And I'm going to tell you, like, 95% of every single plant on that list of every single season is edible or medicinal. <laughs> so it's instead amazing. of going out there and creating chemical warfare with nature, why don't you just go out and eat it? Save yourself a little bit of money and, you know, get healthier. <laughs> One thing that has improved my health substantially is, um, I'm not sure if you guys have heard, it, heard of it, but I'm sure Diamond has it's called nascent iodine. Nascent iodine is an important supplement to many people. The body cannot function properly without iodine, yet it cannot produce iodine on its own. The World Health Organization estimates that over 1 billion people across the globe are at risk for iodine deficiency. This is especially important for expecting mothers who tend to be at an exceptionally high risk because so many people fail to consume sufficient levels of iodine through diet alone, iodine supplementation is crucial. I highly, recommend, I highly recommend using NASIT iodine supplementation on a regular basis. NASIT is a vegan-friendly, deep-earth-sourced NASIT iodine product created to help your body maintain its regular iodine balance. It's manufactured with a unique transformative bioelemental matrix using a revolutionary process and contains nano colloidal nascent iodine. Iodine deficiency can be a serious issue, but nascent iodine supplementation can support the body's use for uh, this essential trace mineral. Nascent iodine keeps uh, thyroid iodine levels in balance, improves thyroid and endocrine system function, may improve emotional disorders by balancing glandular system, helps regulate hormone balances associated with weight gain, works as a moisturizing expectorant for the respiratory tract, a major must if you are a smoker. I am a smoker, and it has helped me tremendously. Helps Jake, protect the thyroid from Jake, stop reading. Oh, my gosh. Jake, so this nascent iodine you're looking for is in any naturally occurring salt. So when you get iodized salt that has nascent iodine in them, the reason people are deficient is because the last 10 years it's not trendy to eat salt. And your doctor's saying, cut out on your salt. So all these people are iodine deficient. If you're listening out there, go to your McDonald's and steal the salt shaker. It has all the iodine you need in it for the next 20 years. People are using Himalayan sea salt and all the sea salt, which doesn't have the iodine that is necessarily in iodine iodized salt so you need to buy the cheap salt and be using the cheap salt in your cooking and then you don't have to buy the expensive supplement if you're a smoker only use cheap salt when the in-laws come over you can put the the i the uh, himalayan salt out on the table but you're killing yourself by eating fancy salt what you need is iodized salt or you need to spend twenty seven dollars per vial of nascent iodine from Jake's supplier and then you can be healthy all you need is the cheap salt that says iodized but in the last twenty years the majority of the uh... you know all of our modern society we're not eating it because we're idiots because the because some government group said don't eat it it causes heart disease and the majority of the things that people tell you make you sick or don't make you sick, actually make you sick. Like diet soda, for instance. It's the most deadly substance, and there are thousands upon thousands of people drinking diet soda right now, this second, that think they're getting healthy. They're killing themselves. They're giving themselves bile duct cancer. They're giving themselves diabetes. And the majority of people drinking diet soda are fat to begin with, and they don't need it. They need water. I've actually lost 100 pounds off of coffee, believe it or not. Yeah, it's a diuretic. <laughs> yep. Mm-hmm. And exercise. And a stimulant. Does the body good. Absolutely. So uh, let's talk about uh, more most common species. I ran off a few. Carrie, I'm, I'm sure you have a list of things that people can go find and eat in abundance that we can go pick. Give us a, some homework. What can we learn about and what can we go out in the woods this weekend and find? Well... Right now, um, the good things going on would be uh, you can harvest yarrow, and yeah. that's that's more of a medicinal plant, but it is also edible as well. 
And you can get, uh, we've got asparagus just getting to the end of its season if you're near uh, ditch banks. We have burdock coming up. The leaves are very edible on those. Cattail shoots are coming up now. Uh, white clover you can find. I've been eating some chickweed lately. Dock, um, those make a great um, kind of a sour dish. Dandelion greens, as long as they're not in flower, if you can find some that are in a shady spot or a little cooler area, those make a great salad right now. Uh, we have penny cresses, we have plantain, mustard, miner's lettuce, wild lettuce, false almond seal. I mean, it, the list just goes on and on. Thistle, salsify, pineapple weed, uh, penny cress, mallow, you know. And of those uh, lawn weeds that HG tells you, HGTV tells you to get rid of right now, um, right now on their list of cool weather crops, which we're kind of getting out of now, where you've got dandelions. You've got thistle that you can scrape the uh, spikes off of and eat. You've got wild carrot, which you've got to be really careful with that one. You want to yeah. remember the queen has hairy legs. And if you can remember the queen has hairy legs, you can remember how to identify wild carrot. Um, there's also pers- and, purslane going right now. There's bird on. Wait, wait, let's stop, right, stop right there because the uh-huh. wild carrot has deadly mimics, and that's the reason you're warning the public, Correct. Exactly. It's it's actually um, m- very much so uh, misidentified as a uh, water hemlock sometimes, yeah. and that's proved to be very deadly. There's stories from Pocatello of families that have, all of them have died from eating what they thought were wild carrots. Now, the difference between the two is Queen Anne's lace, um, you, as I said, she has hairy legs, the stem is hairy, and when you get up to the top, you can see where she was in folklore spinning her lace, she pricked her finger, and there's a single drop of blood in the middle floret. So there's one purple floret in the middle of the top of the umbel. Now, with hemlock, you want to watch out for purple spotting limbs, uh, stems that are smooth. So there'll be purple blotches all over along the bottom up to about the top third of it. And, you know, other than that, they look almost identical to the untrained eye. Yeah, and you don't even want to touch water hemlock. It gets that deadly. Exactly, right. In fact, that's how our town got its name, actually. Um, Our town is Malad City, and that goes back to the early fur trappers. In 1818, a trapper by McKinsey come through here, and his whole party got sick. They thought it was the water, so they named the river Malade River, um, a French word, Malade. And so... In 24, another group come through, and they all got sick. And finally, in about, I think it was 19 or 1836 or somewhere around there, the Bridger team come through, and they were all getting sick. And legend has it, the Washakie Indians happened to be traveling through, and they looked at them, and the first thing they noticed was like, oh, God, these idiots are eating the beaver. And they found out that the beaver are yeah. immune to the water hemlock roots, and they were storing it in the fat around the tail and the rear end of the animal, and that was the sweetest part that the fur trappers would eat. So the Native Americans, these savage, uneducated people, came along, and they saved all their lives by teaching them how to prepare the food. Wow. Oh, and then we murdered them. Aren't we really awesome? Amazing. Yeah, yeah, right. No doubt. <laughs> so, Scott, you know, they, you they had a rich knowledge, our Native people. Oh, yeah, people. definitely. I got Minnesota Chippewa me. I mean, Native Americans, oh, God. Don't get me started. Scott, do you have anything to chime in here? There, as soon as I unmuted, I did. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, yeah, the, I, while you guys were talking, I was out looking for the book, and I, I guess it's like out of print. You can get it used, um, which is fine. And, uh, but, yeah, the, it's, uh, it is out there, but you're going to have to get it uh, used. If you go on the thrift books, it's like five bucks. Exactly. So um, we got a, we got a place yeah. here in town that, that uh, I, I'll definitely go check. To, um, okay, but so, yeah, that so if people are looking for it, it's 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 going to be used at, at at best. So there you go. So if, if you I, don't mind, I'd like to interject yeah, with ahead. a few with a few points to keep in mind when you're trying to identify plants. If you don't mind. Um, yeah, number before one we would get be, there, I wanted to point uh, out to the audience that if you're going to go out there on this homework, the easiest thing you can do is identify a dandelion because they have the yellow flowers. 
you don't want to be eating the greens from dandelions that are already flowered. However, what you can do if you've never eaten a wild edible and you're not near a roadside or somewhere they spray and you find a dandelion with a flower, I want you to pop the flower off, peel the green leaves from the bottom of the flower off of the flower part, so you're just left with the white and the yellow, and eat it. Chew it up, and del- it's delicious. It's delicious, mildly right? sweet. I remember, I, I remember when I was a little boy, I used to take the honeysuckle, pluck them out, and suck the tips of them. They're sweet. Absolutely. There's a little d- drop of uh, sweet nectar inside there. Yeah. But if you've never eaten a wild edible, eating the head of a dandelion is a simple thing you can do to try it out and chew it up. It's not offensive. You might need a little water because sometimes they can be dry if they're older flowers. You want a brand new flower just opened up, and they're delicious, moist, slightly sweet, and they taste of dandelion. Go ahead, Kerry. <laughs> right, right. I, I fully agree with you there. The dandelions are absolutely delicious. And another, that's another plant that makes a good wine, too. You know, dandelion wine is, is actually quite sweet. Um, so, you know, when you're out, um, trying to identify plants. Number one, um, try to learn one at a time. Like you said, go out and go out and identify a dandelion. Once you're completely familiar with that plant, with all of its uses, all of its cooking preparations, learn another one, and build on your on your personal knowledge. You know, one plant at a time. Don't to, don't go out and try to learn 20 plants at a time because you'll never you'll never learn everything about them. Uh, number two would be learn Latin because common names are so interchangeable. I mean. You can have five different plants being called the same common name. So, so learn the Latin uh, so that you know exactly what you're after. Another thing would be get out in the field, you know, taste, smell, observe the plant, look at it, you know, observe its growing habits and get to know that plant really well. You know, and be, be aware of the lookalikes, like with uh, car- the wild carrot, the hemlock, you know, also with sunflowers. Um, a common mistaken one with that when they're young, especially the cocklebur, that can become deadly. Um, rhubarb and burdock leaves, one of them is completely edible. The, the other one has oxalic, oxalic acid, which uh-huh. uh, is pretty damaging. And another one would be portulaca and spurge. You know, portulaca is a great uh, vitamin C source. Um, it's prevented scurvy. It's got all kinds of vitamins and minerals, but spurge is quite poisonous as well so and you want to be also aware of the stages of growth that it's in and also uh, know your terminology so when you're looking up descriptions of plant you know what an alternating leaf pattern is you know what an opposing leaf pattern is you know what the word glabrous means Um, look these terms up and find out exactly what you have it's like a biology class (laughs) definitely (laughs) sorry (laughs) Definitely start from the beginning. Do your homework. There are wild edible groups all throughout the country. They're in every major city uh, and usually have thousands of members. You'd be surprised. Philadelphia has a wild edibles group that meets in Center City and goes out to Fairmont Park in one of the filthiest cities ever and eats the weeds. Right. And, you know, a lot of times people will offer free herb walks and stuff, which I wanted to kind of plug right now, too. Um, Jit. June 2nd, if anybody's going to be in the northern Utah, southern Idaho range, um, I'm going to be holding an herb walk here. We're going to be going up to a canyon that will give us several different um, areas to look through. Um, if anybody is interested in that, just get on my uh, It's going to be blown out. We're going to get 1,000 people there, Carrie. Did you hear that, folks? We've got <laughs> June 2nd an herb walk. Where's the city? No pressure, man. Mlad City, Idaho. <laughs> all right, we're going to have all the information on the, when the video goes up on YouTube so you guys can get out there, take a vacation, and go on an herb walk. And maybe he'll and, have some herb. <laughs> and that, that, that's the exact, that, that, that is the best way to find out what these plants are. Learn from an individual who knows what they are already so they can show you. They can point out differences between, you know, the, what this one smells like, what that one smells like. You know, be with somebody who has got some experience if you are. Yeah, we have. Tons of wild edibles here, and we're on a river. You can imagine the biodiversity. We, you know, we have like 14 varieties of clover throughout the uh, progression through the year. <clears throat> and if anyone comes out here for the summer and stays at the campground, I'd be happy to take them on any wild edibles walk. We'll be doing all kinds of tours like that. It's part of the stuff we're going to be doing with the community out here. But anywhere, if you live in a city, say it again. 
Uh, so when, when's that again? Anytime you come out. Walk out. Oh, anytime you come <laughs> yeah, out. Yeah, if okay, you're here. I'm, yeah. Okay. I eat as cool, I cool. go. It's, called, it's what I do when I walk. <laughs> but if you live in a city of 15,000 or more, you're going to have a wild edibles group in your area in every single, all 50 states. No excuses. All you have to do is go up to Google, put in wild edibles, comma, and your city. And it's going to, then all the Google hits will be all of the wild edibles meet up in your area. Carrie, do you have any other uh, tips? Oh, well, <laughs> as, as in what type of tips would you like? Uh, for, for getting involved in wild edibles groups. Um, just get out there and roll up your sleeves and get on it. You know, don't hesitate. Get out there and figure out what's going on because time's running short. Right. I'm sick and tired of all the people that are constantly talking about doing something and they never do anything. In order to accomplish mm -hmm. something, you have to begin, no matter how small the step is. And as Ice Age Farmer says, it's small steps towards self-sufficiency. If you're not taking steps now, you're never get moving forward. So start moving forward by taking steps, which means this weekend go out and eat a dandelion. And then Google Wild Edibles Group and your city. And head up to Carrie's uh, you know, herb walk on June 2nd in the middle of Utah somewhere. <laughs> Is it in Utah? <laughs> it's, uh, it's 13 miles north of the Utah border in Idaho. Oh, God. So it's up in Idaho. The whitewater is, is bumping up there. So go, you know, get a rafting trip and go on a herb tour. Let's go back to the, uh, let's get back to the uh, Native American talk. I know Jake might want to chime in here and maybe Scott, but let's talk about the dandelion. For those of you who are listening, the dandelion is the key to Native American success. And what I mean by that is it was part of their natural food progression. They moved around where the food was. And as the heavy winters set in here in the Four Corners regions, let's take for instance, they were making pemmican and they were jerking uh, wild game so that they had the protein meat for the winter that they had dried and cured. They were not going to have any wild vegetables. They did stockpile some grains. They had sunflower oil from seeds. And they had some roots that they knew to, that they could dig throughout the winter, but they didn't have any green vegetables per se. So in the spring, when their health was waning and their food supplies were weak, what blossomed out of the ground in the Four Corners region was millions of pounds of dandelion. And that is what gave, gave them the strength they needed to increase their population and keep going. The dandelion is the key vitamin for spring. It was the nutrient that everything was based on. Without the dandelion, no one would be here. No, absolutely. That is um, a perfect analogy. I mean, that's one of the first plants that come up, and it's got all kinds of vitamins. It's full of vitamin A, C, E, B. Um, it's got iron, calcium, potassium. It works as a diuretic, so you're flushing out those um, liver toxins that you've built up through the winter months. And not only is it a diuretic, but it replaces the potassium that most diuretics will pull out of your system. So it's a perfect diuretic for that, too. So I agree. That was definitely a, a mainstay for the Native Americans. And yet we have millions and millions of sick people that spray poison on their medicine in their yards every year. It is a complete oxymoron. Society has become vapid idiots spraying poisons and toxins on their bodies and their yards and they're all wondering why they have to go to the doctor, and there's 14 pharmaceuticals in the medicine cabinet. Stop it! <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and, you know, another thing uh, on touching on that, too, you know, people take multivitamins all the time. We have an abundance of stinging nettle growing out there, and that is a multivitamin in a plant. You can grind that yeah, up, take, dry it out, save I, it, and you are good to go. I take stinging nettle, too. That's what Diamond recommended. It's it's, uh, I make it pretty strong, and it takes a lot to take it down, but, yeah, it, it works. I, don't, I, I like the taste, and if you make it, don't make it that strong, Jake. It's actually an acquired taste. It's kind of sweet. It's abundant. Do you collect your own, or are you buying it online, Jake? Because it's everywhere where you are in Spokane. No, it's, uh, the taste, I mean, it's, I take it down because I know it's really good for me. Well, and I are mean, you collecting it? Uh, no, not yet, but I'll get that. We, 
We got to get you there. It's 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 sprouting now. It's growing everywhere in Spokane by any creek, river, or stream. All you got to do is take off all your clothes and run through the woods. As soon as you start burning, you're in the stinging nettle. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Well, anyways, Diamond, I just wanted to add on an ending note, Diamond, everybody should get familiarized with their cloud, taking great, great detail of cloud formations before a cold front, warm front, and a low-pressure system hit. Observe what the dew point feels like, barometric pressure, um, uh, wind direction, get an analog barometric pressure reader, analog compass. If you know your region real good, say, for instance, if my wind direction is coming from the south and it's really muggy, and the clouds are low in the sky, and if they look like popcorn, that is a huge indication that, okay, there's a 70% good possibility of heavy rain. Because the reason why I say this is because when the system is down, there will be no Google. So no tracking the weather. That will be a thing of the past. So this information is good to say for weather, water collection, water irrigation, for your garden, and so on and so forth. Because the bottom line is you, me, and your mother will need water. Absolutely. The way they used to uh, keep track of weather was with barometers back in the day. All different types. Yeah. They called them weather gauges. So if you do have an analog barometer, you are well out of the game for weather prediction, farming, and just general knowledge of what's going to happen. Most of us, when we hit 40, though, have so many aches and pains that our bodies can tell us what the, what's happening with the weather if we are in tune with our bodies. The problem is that the majority of the world is not in tune with themselves. They're living in the future, they're worried about the past, and no one is alive right now. So they have no idea what's going on. They take a pill. <laughs> when in reality, they should realize there's a huge weather system coming. <laughs> now, how... I'm sorry, I, I'm digressing, but how can we contribute to your cause? Is it Patreon only? Can a person send you a money order check? Do you got a P.O. box? Because I'm old-fashioned. I don't like to use credit online. Well, we're old-fashioned, too, and we don't want your money. We want you to take your money and start preparing to survive and thrive for the future that is inevitable. It's not our mission to collect money from the public. So it's, it's not something that I care about. I care about that the public has the finances that they need to, to prepare, and they're listening to us. So what you can do is help spread the channel by sharing it on your social media because we are being blocked and, and demonetized, and we're out of the logarithmic loop. But if you're sharing it on your social media, all your people will have access to listen to the information on our radio show and our daily updates that they may start to actually catch on because I'm so repetitive that at some point, if you start to listen even a little bit, you, the truth cannot escape you because eventually it starts to catch up with you and reality strikes in. And that's the popping noise we're looking for everyone. And that's their heads coming out of their buttocks. <laughs> you're, you're, you're so Absolutely. repetitive. You're, you're you're so repetitive, Diamond. I've actually renamed all my children and my dog Diamond. So er, everything in my life now is. <laughs> and guess what? All my fish are named Diamond too. That's not my. That was not it's the working. point. <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot of fish in my second. Well, I got forty fish in there. Yeah. Carrie, we have 10 minutes left. Is there? Uh, do you want to plug anything else except your Facebook page? So this is going to be linked below the video. Any of you guys out there, Carrie's uh, the admin, and I guess you started it, the Edible and Medicinal Plants of Idaho and Utah. Mm -hmm. Do you have um, a website? Or? No, that's, that's basically where I go everything from. You know, I'm just a regular guy and trying to keep track of all the information I'm re, um, reevaluating and keeping a uh, repository for those articles that I come across. And also, um, you know, with this coming herb block, also trying to do some community outreach and trying to teach these things through that. So if if anybody wants to be on up to date on what's going on, just, uh, just go through the Facebook page. Yeah, I'll try to get the hemp lucid guys to come out there. They are right, in, they're up in Salt Lake, which is probably a few hours drive from this walk, and they're totally into this stuff. How about a box of potatoes over money, Diamond? Is that suitable? Oh, yeah, as long as they're seed potatoes, because food is free if you grow it. Now, before I go here, I just want to sum up a couple things that have come to mind here. And 
it seems to be a, a little bit of everyone's conversation. It's stemming from Scott's ideas, coming from Kerry's historical information, and simply Jake's implementation of ancient techniques that we've lost knowledge of. And it all comes to what is a society, what is an empire, and why does it continue to fail every thousand years? And why does the entire system get wiped out every ice age completely with no memory, except for a vague, uh, a vague tingling in the back of everyone's head because we're all suffering from amnesia of a massive violent upheaval in, in the past that we are all well aware of. And it all starts with the empire model. Evil people take control and they start to extract the wealth of humanity, which is a spiritual wealth. Humans are spiritual beings. We're supposed to love each other and be helpful. And it, it, we're the exact antithesis of that in the current empire model. It's the way it ends up all the time. It's discussed in the Vedas. So if you want to understand the Mahabharata and other Vedic teachings... Uh, ask an Indian person to get you started, and they're going to bring you right to some of the most ancient texts which describe this cosmic cycle of enlightenment and then destruction, where the human consciousness is actually degraded to a point of a dark age, and that's where we're all living. So the top of the empire model is actually the bottom of the spiritual cycle. So right now we're living in a dark age, and it quickly comes to an end because of a cosmic catastrophe in the form of a climatic shift which create, wreaks havoc on these large populations. Now if we go back into the anthropological record, and we look at archaeology as well as anthropology, during one of the early ice ages, the population was decimated because they just came out of a warm period. And the few people that were still alive started to find each other. And they realized the same thing that humanity is realizing now, that they had to work together, that they each had unique skills that could potentially benefit each other. Because up to this point, everyone was dropping like flies. They were all trying to do it on their own like they used to. And this was the first time in human history, let's say 100,000 or 200,000 years ago, where we actually, as a human race, had to work together to survive. And that's the same way the future is going to be that we're going into. You are not going to walk into the woods with your teepee, your backpack, and your AK-47 and come out alive. You're going to need help. You're going to need support. You're going to need more people and you're going to need to be able to continue the genetics. And this is the way it has been time immemorial. It's why the human race is here. Our population has gone from millions to thousands, back to millions, back down to thousands, time and time again. We know this. We have a clear, clear vision of it for the last 80,000 years on how populations have gone to massive levels and have been completely decimated down to a few thousand people. It's not, not because, it's not because of global warming. It's not because of you're polluting the planet. It's not because you didn't pay your carbon tax. It's because, <laughs> it's because the human cycle of empire collapse and failure is controlled outside of the earth. It is controlled cosmogenically. And until we all realize the spiritual potential of humanity and what our consciousness is, the sheep are going to be brainwashed and continue to stare inside of their squares until they die. And once the, the wake-up call occurs, everyone's going to panic. Those of us that are prepared are going to have to deal with the nightmare. So it's amazing that the enlightened people, usually the ones that have suffered in the past, are the ones that are going to lead us into the future. we got five minutes left, guys. I hope you got something out of that summation. Scott, do you have any final words? Yeah, and, and just, uh, you know, put your feet on the ground, and, you know, like you were saying, Ice Age Farmer, you know, you, I, I, I implore everyone to go at your grocery store or wherever you go to, Every store right now has has a turnstile with seeds in it. Just pick any seed that 
that uh, delights your eye, grab that packet, take it home. You don't even have to buy any special dirt. Just go dig up some dirt in the back corner of the yard and put it in a, put in a, put it in a tray that you got that's just sitting there. Grow those seeds, get them going, and you're going to kill them. And that's okay. <laughs> it's, you, you, I you think Simon go has a good that. point when he says uh, get out there and fail. Yeah, you got to get out there. You got to start somewhere. And there will be nothing like killing your first set of little seedlings. You're going to water too much. You're going to forget about it and go on vacation and come back and they're going to be dead. It's okay. That's the first set. You know, the next next the next set you do, you're going to get a little better at. They're actually going to grow. You'll keep them around a while before you kill them. And usually, you know, by second, third year, you actually got some fruit, some vegetables coming off of something that you can nibble on. And there's nothing more satisfying to your soul than to eat something that you've grown. I, I can't okay. tell you enough. So take the step today. Just grab a, a grab a bag of seeds, put them in some dirt, grow it. And it's okay if you kill it, but you're going to be on that journey towards feeding yourself. <laughs> Amen to that. Think of it this way. If your first sugar snap pea cost $57 to achieve, the <laughs> second one was only 27 bucks, and it halves from there. <laughs> <laughs> that's, about, that's about the right price. <laughs> right. Oh, Jake, no, do you have any final in- words? Yeah, your conclusion, wow, you totally mind effed me. Whew. That was great. <laughs> that was awesome, Diamond. That was really awesome. Well, Jake, thanks Seriously. for coming on the sh- thanks for coming on the show. Anytime, bud. Cool. Carrie, do you have any final words before we get to this commercial and it's all over? Yeah. Um, get out there, get yourself a good field guide, get out in the field, learn those plants now because you're going to need them someday. So get out there and do it. Amen to that. I want to thank everyone for joining us on this episode of Edible and Medicinal Plants. Uh, Carrie Peterson, who runs the Facebook page, who's going to have a wild edible meetup on June 2nd, which you can access below this video when we put it up on YouTube. I want to thank Jake from Spokane, who regularly emails me, as well as many other subscribers with information on their local areas, local weather, what they're doing, uh, the tiny steps that they're taking to learn something new, because the times we're going into, everything is going to be new. And I'll tell you what, there's an easy thing you can do. I want you to go out uh, to your garage, to the main breaker, and turn it off. And then just go sit down and start to write down on paper all the things that, are, that you need to do if that stays that way. The first thing you're going to panic about is your food. All the food in your freezers and your refrigerators are going to go bad. And as soon as that goes bad, you'll have no more food to eat. Do you have a generator to hook that up to? What is your plan? I guarantee that 95% of the people listening right now do not have a backup plan. If they were to trip that breaker for five days and never leave the house, they may be starving. And that's a wake-up call you need to do. So start thinking outside of the box. That's why we had the edible and medicinal plants uh, talk tonight, because it's just another facet in the in huge network of things that you need to be thinking about to survive and thrive in the coming times. The waning magnetosphere is almost a guarantee that the grid will fail in the next decade completely. There's not enough money on the planet to fix it in time. So even if it takes a decade to fix, if you turn your breaker box off for 10 years, can you make it? The answer is probably no. If you do a few small things every day in a few weeks, the answer could probably be yes. That means just spending 5 or $10 a day on some dried goods like rice and beans. Jake was hitting on the fact that canned goods, a can of beans, if you don't bend it and keep it in the dark, can literally last until you die and still be good. Mm-hmm. There are so many cheap things. You could find enough money in the seams of your couch to start prepping today and it'll keep you alive for another day. That's how you think outside of the box. The medicinal wild edibles is a little, is I think more of a, a moderate level of preparedness, somewhere in the uh, black diamond, blue, tri- uh, blue square range of ski run, 
uh, where after you have some dry goods and some flashlights and batteries stocked up, then you can wander out in the woods and start to learn how to harvest your own wild food. There are so many levels. Have you ever shot a gun? Have you ever killed an animal? You may have to to survive. It may be time to learn how to hunt. Get a hunting license. It may be, if you don't want to shoot an animal, it may 